Video Trade. This is Don Kaufman. It's July 20th, 2019, and you are watching the Theo Trade Weekend Update. On this weekend's update, I'm going to try to answer the question, how fragile are these markets? Now, that question really stems from some of the commentary out of the Fed this week. There was all kinds of Fed speak, but specifically in the story that most of you are more than aware of, there was Fed commentary from, uh, from Williams, who's the head of the New York Fed. Those comments then were later walked back. Now, I'm just saving the whole background of the story over here. Listen, he made a comment that was purely academic, and then they had a press release later on Thursday that simply said, no, 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 that's not what it intended to be. That was 20 years of academic research. Effectively, the marketplace had thought on Thursday it was going to be a 50 basis point cut. Then they turned around and actually clipped that idea. We're back to a 25 basis point cut. The bottom line with this, when I asked that bigger question, okay, of, you know, is this marketplace in trouble? Like, how fragile is it? The Fed right now is being just overly cautious, a very limited amount of ammunition left. And the bottom line is the Fed is completely priced in. Now, other things that lead us to believe the marketplace is extraordinarily, extraordinarily okay, dangerous right now is Chinese GDP came in this week at 6.2%. The market didn't even flinch. Okay, Netflix subscriber misses huge. I think that was largely misinterpreted. When I talk about like Netflix subscribers, you know, I brought that up on last weekend's video and I was looking extensively okay, for the number of subscribers, not because I want to hear that there's competition, you know, Netflix and uh, people are talking about, well, Disney, listen, Disney's streaming service doesn't even come online, doesn't come online uh, effectively until like what? mid to late fall. So the subscriber misses in Netflix, that coupled with, if you look at the rails, like CSX actually guided lower. It's one of the major rails. They guided lower. Now we did have positive news from Microsoft. We're actually going to be looking at Amazon earnings this next week. And we have the ECB to the rescue. Listen, okay. There is no question okay, of how fragile this marketplace happens to effectively be. The, the only question that really kind of resides is what is going to be the broader impact on this marketplace effectively moving forward? And one of the things that can help answer that, okay, well, number one, the SPX this past week, it broke through the bottom of a very tight expected move. But even more importantly is that uh, on a week that, again, we finished the week down, not anything massive on a point move, we finished the week down, but the this coming week's expected move is actually bounced up to almost $41 expected move next week, but that's about a 25% increase in the expected move week over week. As I said, you've actually got ECB, that's the European Central Bank to the rescue, Super Mario, it's expected largely to be going out into juicing the marketplace. So a lot that we learned this week and, and to help answer that question, you know, how fragile are these markets? Well, clearly, okay, we are entering into a slowing economy. I believe actually, again, the Netflix subscribers is one of the key takeaways of this week, that it's not necessarily just competition, that it's people clipping their membership to save a couple of bucks. It's the first sign of a recession in most cases. Am I going to as far to as say there's a recession coming? Absolutely not. Nevertheless, you couple that with Chinese GDP, you couple that with the fact that the ECB, listen, it's the entire global growth slowing down versus central bankers. And if you look at what the central bank did just this week, specifically, we'll get into the Fed here, okay? They are being overly, overly cautious with the limited ammunition they have left. And that's probably the biggest takeaway of this entire last week of trade. I mean, that was those comments that came out of Williams. All right, you know, push that aside a little bit. It was misinterpreted. But the later press release, completely and totally inappropriate because I believe that it kind of disarmed the Fed effectively moving forward. And that's why I said the Fed is largely priced in. With that, let's get down to some details and to some real trade opportunities, not just talk about opinions here, but really where some of this can be turned into degrees of profitability. With that, let's get to it. Let's get to some charts, a couple of trade ideas. All right, to some of the charts and trades we go. Some of the commentary that we just had a moment ago on the video section here, you know, how fragile are the markets? That is in no way, shape or form 
okay, to build a case, if you would, for bearishness. Now, most of you are probably aware, if you've tuned into any of these videos prior to, that uh, I am a bit of a bear in the marketplace. What I really kind of detailed these comments for, and it's again, the Fed commentary from Williams are walked back and China GDP at 6.2%, the number of Netflix subscribers and that miss and the CSX guides lower, um, you know, Microsoft, Amazon earnings coming. I'll get to all of that in just a moment. The ECB, again, that's not, I don't want it to be misconstrued that, you know, we're building another bearish case over here. I don't need to build a bearish case. The marketplace will do that for me. It's the opportunity and specifically, and, and what I really like to get, you know, down to kind of on the, uh, on the charts and on some of the trade ideas is precisely how, okay, this can translate into degrees of trades and more importantly, degrees of profitability. And again, with all of these facts, like right in front of you, I mean, listen, this is just the last week of trade. Okay. First and foremost, this coming week, which is, yeah, it's another July week. It's going to be a, it's slow summer. Please. This could be Mr. Toad's wild ride once again in a week. I mean, we had a late day sell-off on a Friday, okay, in what was utterly a low liquidity day. If you take a look at the, uh, you know, Friday's trading session, a slow grind to the downside, followed by some extreme sell side. And uh, the interesting thing about uh, Friday was, and I wanted to detail this on the chart, right there, that's the close. We just kept right on going after the close. But the point being, again, of all of this commentary, okay, to me, how does it actually translate into degrees of trade ideas and so forth? Right now, it's all about the volatility, okay? Right now, it really is. To me, it's all about the volatility, okay? And secondarily, it's about risk reward. Now, the risk reward is going to lead us to a number of bearish trades. I'll get that here in just a moment. When I talk about volatility though, and I said one of the biggest opportunities is, all right, just in this last week, you're staring down the face of this. This being again, you know, GDP and Netflix subscribers and yada, yada, yada. We could just go detail, 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 right? Close that up for a second. Forget about it. Okay. The bottom line, we're sitting in an under, an under a 15 VIX with all of this effectively going on. Now, you could probably point fingers and say, well, the Fed is doing this and the Fed is doing that. Forget all of it, okay? None of that commentary matters. All that matters is that you realize on one side of the equation, right? On one side of the equation here, there's mounting risk. It's a risk, it's a risk, it's a risk, it's a risk. It's CSX and it's Netflix and it's this and it's that and it's other, okay? On the other side of the equation, right? Right here, you have central banks, okay? And this is just... This is this is right over here. Here's your Fed, okay? Here's the ECB, you know, the Bank of Japan. And it's it, you're almost getting like David versus Goliath, except you're not really sure which is which. In this case, the risks are clearly mounting, okay? The central banks are on the opposing side of it. Now, that's the bigger picture, okay? The comments that I made about the Fed, okay, well, any of the central banks, they only right now have so much ammunition. And to me, you know, when the ECB comes out like later this week, okay, they're already in negative interest rate, <laughs> but Mario Draghi, his term is almost up. He could make a couple of fireworks this week. Again, all of this just amounts volatility, 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 and volatility looks to me inherently low. Now, that's that judgment call that you're going to have to make for yourself. Okay. With all the mounting risks in the economy, how could the VIX only be, for instance, at, at 14 and changing? Frankly, I don't, I don't love looking at the VIX, the S&P 500 volatility index, because again, it's, it's, uh, it's too old school of an indicator. But I think that in a broader sense, most people kind of understand what I'm saying by interpreting the VIX, because most people understand the VIX. And again, the big takeaway here, it's low, right? And again, Maybe it should be. Maybe it should be because the markets are effectively at all time highs. But the opportunity in here, okay, right now, this is not a time to be out there and trying to sell a bunch of premium, okay? In fact, there, uh, there's a lot of research that's been done. This earnings period, 
that we're coming into right now here in July of 2019 actually has lower volatility, okay, than many of the previous quarters. Net net, if you look at the volatility of like the Facebook and the Netflix and the Apple and the Microsoft, the volatility is substantially lower coming into this uh, this earnings period which right there tells you like there's some huge opportunity and why is there a huge opportunity? Listen, Netflix already smashed through what it was expected to effectively move. Microsoft, found Microsoft interesting because Microsoft uh, literally went to the upper edge of the expected move and a complete and full like reversal. The opportunity right now, especially, okay, in the equity marketplace, you wanna be a net buyer of premium means long gamma strategies, long gamma strategies. You're buying option premium. That, and I don't like to just go, I don't like to go home and be like, I just bought a call, I bought a put. All right, I gotta use spreads, long gamma, long gamma, long gamma. It's important that you have that kind of takeaway, whatever, okay, that translates to you, whether you wanna be bullish or bearish. Because again, my case right now isn't so much about, you know, being bearish. That's easy enough, right? It's about, long volatility plays. Now, the other really big one that's a long volatility play, I'm gonna be using infinity spreads and risk to a spreads, okay? Uh, pretty much until the hands bleed. By the way, that statement means that uh, you press the mouse button so many times, the hand starts bleeding from, uh, from placing these. Those types of trades, okay, are way out in the future. They're all volatility, like, plays, right? They're all volatility trades into which if the marketplace, and again, this is where that, you know, neither bullish nor bearish, but if the marketplace is going to make this explosive move higher, an explosive move lower based on central banks, okay, and please, this is a very binary market, you know, don't be put off by the fact that we can explode higher or lower. You just have to trade with that knowledge kind of in the back pocket over there. The infinity spreads, though, could be uh, could really come to fruition. And an infinity spread, again, it's just a series of ratio back spreads to the upside, ratio back spreads, or a version of ratio back spreads to the downside. Get them on. Get them on. Keep them on. Quarter after quarter, keep rolling out your infinity spreads, your risk twist spreads. Okay, For those of you that have portfolios, okay, a big takeaway, if you have a portfolio, 401k, an IRA, okay, anything that's long this marketplace, Hedge now or forever hold your peace. And I really do mean that. And I'm not saying hedge because there's going to be a down move. I'm saying hedge like how much risk do you really want to take, All right? You should probably take whatever your portfolio is and kind of figure out like, hey, the spiders, the S&P 500 in the next 30 days is poised to move $9, okay? But options lately, and this is the exact point I really want to drive home over here, options lately, they haven't done that good of a job of handicapping risk. Take this number of $9 and double it. That's two times the expected move. What I'm saying is think about your portfolio like this, okay? Here's the S&P 500. Let's just round it. Let's call the S&P 500, okay, 300. The spiders are at 300, all right? And we're going to round this as well up to about 10 bucks. In the next 30 days, roughly you can expect about a $20 move to the upside, about a $20 move to the downside, Okay. Question mark for you, can you handle it? And you're like, oh yeah, to the upside if you have a portfolio, of course, okay? But you gotta look at some of the downside risks. I'm telling you, the volatility's here. I mean, come on, we're 30 days out and the vol is like 13% in the spiders, okay? And see anything wrong with that? Yeah, we're moving way more than the options are giving us credit for, way more. Now, I could get into a three-hour conversation about why the market's moving more Okay, then the options are giving us credit for. And that actually relates, interestingly enough, back to low interest rates. But that's, it's out of the scope of what I want to cover now. You just have to recognize, okay, the risks that sit right here in front of you right now. Now, as I said, I wanted all of this to translate into degrees of opportunity. Now, here comes a couple of aspects that you also have to be aware of. This next week of trade, there's going to be obviously more earnings, okay? Amazon. All right. I think the assumption is Amazon's going to knock it out of the park, yada, yada, yada. But if they don't, okay, this could be insane in terms of the market because Amazon, given the sheer, okay, market cap, the magnitude, if you would, of this underlying, okay, this could be a game-changing event. Now, uh, the reason I'm really specifying Amazon, okay? Not to pick on Amazon at all. 
comes out on July 25th after the market. Yeah, unfortunately though, so does our, uh, our friends at Google. And the combination of those two, okay, this, this is going to be, again, a very uh, possibly dull week to begin with, but is going to end with a, uh, with a bang, all right? These two underlyings, uh, effectively, okay, they're going to own the NASDAQ later in the trading week. Now, uh, we'll look for earnings-related trade opportunities in either of these, but in a larger sense right now, okay, I just, again, I want to display the degrees of volatility. Like, can you imagine right now if an Amazon misses? You've already had some, you know, negative news out there. There's a tipping point that I will suggest that could be hit this week with earnings. All right. The tipping point is you get any other large tech companies that are going to come out. If they're going to miss, right, the marketplace could tip and we could be in a very fast market condition, very volatile market condition. All right, so backing up to some of the opportunities, okay, one of the larger opportunities in this marketplace right in front of us, it has a lot to do with risk reward. Now, here's an underlying that I've detailed just time and time again, like the XLP, okay, and this happens to be none other than consumer staples. Consumer staples, it's just been literally a freight train to the upside. If you take a look at the year-to-date percentage, up about 18%. Now, I'm using this. I'll use, for instance, XLU. I'm also taking positions in XLU, which is utilities, okay? I'm just going to use this as a proxy, okay, for understanding kind of risk-reward. In the XLP, I am currently in what we term a duration style position. A duration style position in this case, all right, is absolutely unequivocally, I'm in a bearish stance in the XLP. My bearish stance, okay, doesn't, it doesn't stem from me looking at consumer staples and thinking like, oh, I'm so bearish on Walmart. Ooh, you know, Procter Gamble. I, I mean, by the way, those are some of the constituents, the uh, the products that actually comprise the XLP. You know, it, it, it doesn't stem from that, okay? It stems like on the surface from a logic of a trade. It stems from the fact that I look at the risk, okay, reward. And do I see upside potential in this product? You know, a lot of people don't realize you get into a bearish trade, you might, oh, you must be outright bearish. Okay. Okay. Listen, I don't know. All right. What the Fed's about to do. I don't know what the ECB is about to do. There could be absolutely more upside in here. Okay. The aspect that makes me execute the trade isn't, okay, necessarily the bearishness of a particular product. It's the fact that I believe that the upside potential, okay, at this point in time, the upside potential is extraordinarily limited versus some of the downside risks. That is enough on the surface, okay, to get me to execute a position. Now, that's something that, you know, people are like, well, uh, how exactly? Listen, this is something we cover in detail in a number of the courses here at Theotrade, but I just wanted to emphasize that Okay, that when you look at a product, you know, when you think about like the XLP, it's already up 18% in the year-to-date basis. All right, forget about it, just stop right there. Does it have another 18% of upside over here? Okay, I mean, a lot of things would have to go in the favor of the entire marketplace for this thing to appreciate another 18%. So with half the year left, I'm comfortable. I'm comfortable though on a duration position. And duration means I got to hold this thing in excess of like three months. I may have this position, okay, for a year. I mean, if you take a look back at some of the other positions I've mentioned, I'll talk about Caterpillar kind of briefly. Caterpillar year-to-date basis is all over the place, but I've actually held a Caterpillar position, okay? Now for, uh, what are we, like, you know, 19 months, okay? We initiated the Caterpillar, uh, Caterpillar position back here, okay, in January, January of 2019, just riding it to the downside, okay? Some people ask, why are you still in that position? Because it ain't over yet. Okay. I'm not, you know, again, I know that people want to book profits and move on. I am. I'm taking the Caterpillar position and I'm rolling it and I'm taking the Caterpillar position and I'm rolling it. Now, okay. Other opportunities that I see now, again, the XLP is one of them. The XLU, these are products that are up, you know, 16, 20, 25%. 
in a year that, you know, hasn't necessarily been stellar, okay, for those. Interestingly enough, I'm uh, bringing up the XRT, which is, uh, this is a retail ETF, all right? And if you look at a year-to-date percentage in here, okay, the retail ETF is only up about 2%, but consumer staples is up, what, about 18%. Huge, huge gaping divergence in that one. I also take a look at an underlying like Starbucks. Okay. I mean, here's another opportunity. Now I could poke fun at Starbucks all day. They're selling liquid crack. Okay. Earnings are coming out. Um, again, maintaining a position inside of Starbucks up 40%. The risk reward in here happens to be absolutely phenomenal. And I'll detail again, a couple of trades on that front. Last but not least on this weekend's update, again, talking about opportunity in the face of mounting risks. So we know that volatility is one. We know that we can actually go after risk reward. Another aspect that I, I really want to bring to fruition, uh, fruition here is I look okay at the financials and I look extensively at the financials and I think this is probably a shorter duration trade. Okay, Look for the financials to snap back into this 2650 range. The financials at this point... They have fared really well since the beginning of the year, but the point being is we're cutting rates, we're cutting rates, we're going to cut rates, and I feel that the uh, the marketplace, the S&Ps have kind of priced that in. It's a good thing, but it's not necessarily cutting rates is not a good thing for the financials. And if this uh, if this marketplace is to take a uh, take a little bit of a dump, it has to be done on the back of the financials. And I've always reiterated that. Listen. Technology could spark sell side activity, but the financials, okay, are predominantly where I'm going to go after the trades. Why? You know, going after trades inside of Netflix and a Facebook, okay, it's it could be a lesson in like you know futility, if you will, because you have to put so much you know capital at risk to go after those. But the backbone of this marketplace is still going to be these financials, and to kind of further that. Uh, interestingly enough, the financials, the volatility is a bit elevated in the financials in the next two weeks. Why? Look at that. You got ECB, then you got the Fed, and you could already see that being priced into the financials. Just this week, there's almost a 50 cent, almost a 50 cent expected move. Okay. I look at that as opportunistic. I think the financials are probably going to move more than 50 cents this week, which is going to lead me to uh, some short duration style trades inside of any of the financials like the XLF or the financial components themselves, the cities, the JP Morgans, the Bank of America's over here. I like it. Okay. Financials, they are sitting at a lower volatility than maybe an Amazon. Okay. Nevertheless, Again, backbone of the marketplace happens to be those financials. There's a lot to think about in this kind of weekend's update. Don't consider, okay, because it's July that this is going to be a, a dull summer. As you saw late in the day on Friday, S&Ps are more than capable of making some moves. We also now have, okay, a what? An SPX with an expected move that just expanded out by 25 plus percent, okay, week over week. We did breach the bottom of the expected move, okay, and this next week of trade, now we're looking at over a $40 expected move, which isn't much, it's still not much, given the fact that so much is going to be breaking late in this week. Thanks, everybody, for joining us here at Theo Trade. Have a wonderful weekend. Bye-bye.